I'd like to welcome everyone back to our Bible study. Uh, last session, we were dealing with Mark 11, and the verses were 12 through 14, and then 20 through 25. A word of explanation, I suppose, is necessary. Uh, generally, we use the four readings from the Revised Common Lectionary, which are four readings for every week of the year. Uh, there are many kinds of lectionaries, but uh, many in the United Methodist Church that use lectionaries, which means a cutting. Uh, lection means reading, and so you have a lectern, which is a desk to read from. So lectionary is a series of readings. And those four readings for every week that we use for worship are Hebrew scriptures, often called Old Testament. The Psalms is the second. The third would be uh, epistles and uh, the book of Acts. And then the fourth reading every week would be the gospel lesson. And uh, we do these through a cycle of a year at a time. And we have cycles A, B, and C. In cycle A, the gospel of Matthew is the principal gospel. Year B, Mark is the principal gospel. And year C, Luke is the principal gospel. And then uh, the gospel of John is broken up and spread throughout the three cycles, but primarily ends up being in cycle B with Mark because Mark is such a much shorter gospel than the other gospels. And, and so our reading today has to do with Jesus' teaching, uh, really not so much of a teaching, but as a symbolic action of cursing a fig tree. Uh, the previous readings, as we come up to the cursing of the, of the fig tree, uh, is the healing of blind Bartimaeus. And then after that, we have the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And that's what we Christians celebrate on Palm Sunday. And now we have Jesus and his disciples staying out at Bethany, which is for all intents and purposes, a uh, suburb of Jerusalem. And so as they come in from Bethany uh, and they're moving towards the temple, as a matter of fact, and the Temple Mount, where the temple is built, one of the highest places in all of Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus, who Mark tells us is hungry, spies this fig tree. And when he sees the fig tree, he goes to it uh, because he can't tell from a distance whether it has figs or not. It doesn't have figs. And then we're told by Mark that it wasn't the season for figs. And so we wonder, why does Jesus curse this fig tree? And uh, if you know anything about the Gospels, you know that oftentimes things that look like they're just uh, practical uh, items that come down the pipe uh, are actually symbolic representations of other things. And so for Mark, the fig tree represents not only the temple, but the temple mount. And that's why when we get a little further into our lesson today, you will see the business about uh, faith as to remove mountains. It's not talking about regular old mountains that we're used to going in vacation. That It is the temple mount will be... Uh, plucked up, removed, and thrown into the sea. And of course, the sea is not just the Mediterranean Sea, which isn't too far from Jerusalem, but it, it's this primordial sea, the sea of chaos, from which God separated the land from the water. So the water always represents chaos for ancient people because it was so large and it was so unruly and it was very, very terrifying to many of the people. That's why sailors in the ancient world were seen as some of the most heroic and brave people. They were courageous because they went into the sea, which is like going into chaos. 
And so the next day after Jesus curses this uh, fig tree, and he curses it by saying no one will ever eat fruit from this tree again, uh, his disciples hear it. And so the next day as they're walking by, they notice that this fig tree is shriveled and dead from the roots up. In other words, in totality, roots, branches, leaves, everything. It is just dead, dead, dead. And uh, so uh, Peter remembers what Jesus had said the previous day. And he said, Rabbi, look how the fig tree you cursed has dried up. And so uh, this is Mark's way of saying that what Jesus did in the cursing of the fig tree is so apparent that even Peter, who is often dense about these kinds of things, even Peter notices and Peter remembered. And so then Jesus, we pick up our text today at verse 22. Jesus responded to them, that is the disciples that were walking with him back into Jerusalem, have faith in God. Now, this is an odd sort of saying because Jewish people were all faithful people. Uh, today, we have a choice because we're Americans and we're individuals and we're autonomous and we decide to do whatever we want to. Uh, even when it flies in the face of things like public health, we think that we make our own decisions and nobody tells us what to do. Uh, so we decide whether or not we are going to have faith in God through Christ. We decide whether we're going to go to church. We decide whether we're going to participate in the ministries of the church. We decide what and if we're going to give to the church and by how much we will give to the church. Everything is an individual decision with us. That's why the pandemic has been so difficult for so many people is it's robbed them of their decision-making, and it makes people mad. It makes people angry. It makes people do irrational things, um, which I don't want to talk about. So Jesus responded to them, have faith in God. And so this is an odd thing to say to a people that are all faithful. But what Jesus is about to tell them will require a great deal of faith for them. I assure you that whoever says to this mountain be lifted up and thrown into the sea and doesn't waver but believes what is said will really happen, it will happen. <clears throat> and so in this business, if you remember that the fig tree is a symbol for not only the temple, but the temple mount, when you talk about lifting up the temple mount and throwing it into the sea, which could represent chaos, what you are doing is seeing what Mark is saying about the destruction of the temple. And people who had faith in God, as Jesus has just said, have faith in God, understand that when the Romans tear down the temple, that somehow the power and the will of God is implicit in this particular action. If God did not allow it, it would not happen, in, in other words. And uh, so what we have to do here is a lot of people think that this business about prayer and the mountains and having faith and so forth, all of this are just generic platitudes about faith and prayer and worship and so forth. What we need to remember here in these very obscure, troublesome, in some ways to understand statements of Jesus is to understand what Mark's concrete situation is out of which he is writing. Uh, he is writing out of a time, probably between 66 and 70 in the first century, when the Romans will just crush the insurrections by the Jewish people, by the zealots, by the Sicarii, by other groups within Judaism that are trying to get rid of the Romans. And the Romans finally have it up to here and they just crush uh, the people in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Palestine. 
And what they do is they completely tear down the temple. About the only thing that's left of the temple when the Romans get done with it is the Wailing Wall, which is still in use today. And Jews go there to pray and to wail uh, to God. Um, so, <clears throat> be lifted and be thrown into the sea and doesn't waver but believes that what is said will really happen, it will happen. And it will really happen because God wills it. And the temple and the temple mountain are completely destroyed as the focus, as the center, as the core of who Jews are and who their identity is. And then Jesus says, therefore I say to you, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you will receive it and it will be so for you. And whenever you stand up to pray, you if you have anything against anyone else, forgive so that your Father in heaven may forgive you for your wrongdoings. Now, here is the critical shift that Jews are going to have to make, especially if you believe that when Mark is talking about removing mountains and throwing them into the sea, he's actually talking about the temple and throwing it into chaos, and it's completely destroyed from the roots up, just like the fig tree that Jesus cursed. So in a sense, you could say that as Jesus cursed the fig tree, symbolically, he was cursing the temple. Why would Jesus do such a thing? Because Jesus always was on the side of the poor and the oppressed, and uh, the peasants in Palestine were sorely uh, oppressed by the religious authorities, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the scriptural lawyers, all of those kind of people pressed down your common, ordinary, working people. And they were backed up by the Roman government, by the Roman military, and by the authority of that military machine that was the Romans in this first uh, century. Now, for Jews, this would have been the greatest of all tragedies for the temple to be removed because it symbolized for Jewish people what was the center, the core of their religious faith. And so, uh, as the temple is destroyed, they see that their place of prayer is destroyed. And sometimes people confuse a place or an institution with the faith itself. Uh, sometimes people think about the church. We have a situation in our congregation. We have a lovely, wonderful historic chapel and I've talked to numerous people in and around Salada who said that uh, when we stopped having worship services in the chapel, that they could not come to the church anymore because we had taken their church away from them. Well, in the time that we had uh, services in the chapel, which were the first two years that I was here, I've noticed that many of the people that said they can't come didn't come anyway. And so sometimes in our minds, we get the idea that this piece of turf or this building is in itself our faith in God. What Jesus is trying to say in these um, aphorisms that he gives about prayer and faith and so forth is to say, now that this geographical place of prayer has been ripped out of its uh, roots, by its roots, and thrown into the sea of chaos, now everywhere becomes a place of prayer, uh, that people can pray anywhere that they wish, and uh, this God that they worship is uh, strong enough and great enough and powerful enough uh, that nothing is impossible for this God. This God can do anything, and that is to grant the prayers that we offer uh, to this God. It's like this idea of prayer can happen anywhere is like the idea of the priesthood of all believers. Uh, in, in some parts of Christian history, we have believed that only a priest 
could hear a confession. Only a priest could forgive sins and so forth. And uh, when Martin Luther came along, he tried to say that the whole community of faith is like a cadre of priests that we become priests to one another. I hear your confession, you hear my confession, and that we all do ministry together. So there's no hierarchy uh, in ecclesiology that everyone is equal under the law of God. And so uh, I would invite you uh, to be with us next week as we come back to uh, do our Bible study. We will continue in Mark, and uh, I continue to hope the best for you and for yours. So thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.